Welcome. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Katrina Fregadaki and I'm an assistant professor here in the machine learning department. I'd like to congratulate you for being here. Um, and in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give a very short introduction to my research. Okay, I work on 3D visual recognition, 3D um, computer vision. And um, I don't know how many of you are interested in computer vision, but uh, most of you will know it through static images and fantastic object detector networks that detect objects put to the bounding boxes and spit out their segmentations. Um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar about this uh, large revolution that started in computer vision in 2012. And one big driving force behind, behind deep neural networks that everybody knows are the datasets, are large scale datasets collected from internet images and videos and assembled together and labeled with thousands of dollars using Amazon Mechanical Turkers. Now, the problem with those datasets are not just the labels that, you know, humans learn with very little labels. And here we have millions of category labels. The one problem that I see is the data themselves. Uh, for example, look at this beautiful tiger image. To take this tiger image, you need to go in the jungle and uh, figure out the clutter in the jungle. You need to search quite a bit. Then you'll find the tiger. Then you need to take your camera and zoom and make a beautiful uh, tight box around the tiger. And then the only thing that the computer vision algorithm will need to, to say is just the label of the tiger. While finding, attending to the tiger in the first place is a super hard problem, okay? And basically what has happened is we have disconnected computer vision from the data acquisition process, how an embodied agent, a moving agent here, a small toddler, goes around and collects images. Because those images look very different than internet images. Internet images are beautiful and interesting. If it was some, you know, the part of your shoe, you wouldn't have uploaded in the web in the first place, right? It's going to be something fun and well attended, well captured. Now, who would put now this picture on the, on the internet? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, so the other thing you realize by looking at this uh, footage is that the single image doesn't tell the, the whole story. You really need to understand the video, see the girls playing the video game, and so on and so forth. So CNNs are great for image recognition once the objects are in a good scale and uh, you know centered and so on, but they do fail in videos dramatically. Why? Because there's no object permanence. There's no spatial common sense whatsoever in that visual processing. Like frame comes in, uh, and frame comes out, and the objects that leave the frame, they're forgotten forever, and objects change scale dramatically. If you're a robot playing soccer, for example, Manuela Veloso, who used to be here in the machine learning department, had these little robots playing soccer. When the ball is far away, you see the ball as being a tiny little thing, far away in the field. When you are holding the ball and running, then the only thing you can see is this orange thing in your, in your retina. And this poses tremendous problems in, in computer vision. Right? This poses tremendous problems in computer vision. Um, and, and what we're saying here is in images, there is this entanglement, this confusion between how the camera moves and how the scene looks like. And the computer vision people know about this entanglement, and that's why they have invested a lot in SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, which is very geometrically driven algorithms that essentially take a video and separate it into what you see here, the point cloud, the 3D map of the scene and the camera trajectory, how the camera moves. Okay, and you see how many cameras, how much the camera had to go around to make that map? Did you see how many, uh, this, look at how many dark blue triangles. Each of those triangles is the positioning of the camera. All right, so, so to make this beautiful map, you really need to go around and see all possible things from, from the scene. So one problem here, I mean, the good thing is that there is permanence and yeah, you get the map and so on. Uh, what does object permanence mean? This means that this teddy bear, it was not there in every frame. It was in some frames and then yet it ended up in the map, right? So that's good. But the problem with, with SLAM is that there is no imagination. SLAM cannot imagine anything. If you throw it in another office scene, again, it's to go around like crazy, see every part of the room and so on to make for you this beautiful map. While you guys, that you are trained visual agents, you'll be able to say, take one picture and totally imagine what's behind the computer screen. I mean, there's not going to be any humor or something. It's just going to be some flat uh, black thing and that's it. So people learn to complete what they see because they, they learn internal models 
by moving around, they learn to map these incomplete observations, single view observations to complete abstract versions of the 3D reality, okay? And this is what our uh, lab has been trying to do exactly, try to combine deep learning with geometric processing and geometric intelligence by essentially taking visual, uh, you know, RGB or RGBD videos and mapping them to 3D feature maps. 3D, so featureizations of the scene that the videos depict. Okay, what do I mean by 3D feature maps? So I, 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 many of you that you are familiar with deep learning, you know about 2D feature maps, right? Uh, which is width by height of the image by number of channels. And here we have width by height by depth by number of channels. And if you have moving objects in the scene, then every object is a separate 3D feature map, okay? Yeah, so wh what is cool about those 3D feature maps? Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have time to, to explain how the neural nets work, and let alone that is the most technical thing and is not that much fun. But I just want to tell you that in the heart of the neural net, what happens is that you are estimating how the camera moves. You keep track of uh, where you move your, your, your eye. Um, and you, you, you essentially undo this motion before you dump the features and you aggregate them in that latent map, in the latent state. And whoever of you are familiar with recurrent nets, you know about latent states. Again, here there's a latent state. It's just it's three-dimensional. Okay, and again, you need to update it with every frame. But you, before doing that, you really need to estimate the motion, make sure you don't dump features um, override to one another. And you see here, you have a toaster, and the toaster is not moving, the camera is moving. And because you do this ego stabilization in the heart of the network, in its bottleneck, then the 3D feature map is consistent over time, if that makes any sense. Actually, I just thought that maybe my, my video is switched off. Do you think I need to switch it on? Or maybe this is not important. Let me start the video. Oh, here, that's me. Okay. Okay, so this is how it works, but I want to go more abstract, and here is why 2D RNNs fail, because the corner is all over in the hidden state memory. So how the camera moves is actually what dictates uh, the state of that hidden uh, memory. And the answer, the question here is, what can you do with those architectures? Okay, this looks like a fun, we married geometric, um, you know, uh, slum with uh, deep learning We're using these geometry aware networks, but, but what can you use them for? Well, the answer is you should be able to use them wherever you use CNNs, okay? For example, a favorite task for computer vision people is detecting objects. So you can detect objects with uh, geometry aware networks. It's just instead of having images and mapping them to 2D bounding boxes, here you have 3D feature maps and you map them to 3D bounding boxes and you can train it supervised. But the most important task is view prediction. You can train the weights of this network without any annotations just by predicting views. You move around in the scene, you're an embodied agent and can move around, you can move around your camera and say how things will look like if I go from that viewpoint, then you make your prediction, then you move from that viewpoint, you take a picture and you take an error. You just subtract your prediction from the ground truth and you backpropagate the error. And this architecture is end-to-end um, -end differentiable convolution and so on, and then can be trained to do this view prediction. So what does it mean to train this network for view prediction? It means that after it's trained, you should be able to feed it a single image, and this should be able to map it in the full 3D feature map of the scene, which means it's gonna learn to complete what's missing. It's gonna learn to complete, I see some yellow car here in the input, it's gonna learn to complete what's behind the front of the car. You should be able to see the complete of the car and you should be able to road behind it and so on and so forth. So it's gonna learn a complete internal model given that highly incomplete uh, 2D or 2.5D observation, right? So this is the imagination ability, which is actually pretty, pretty important uh, for correspondence and so on. And I just want to tell you that you can read our paper, a learning spatial common sense to see the technology behind that. And I'm showing here that this type of architectures have dramatic generalization over previous methods that do not do this geometric consistency, basically, in their bottleneck. You see here, we train it on two objects and they can generalize to multiple objects while, so there are some artifacts on the GIF, while previous methods, you know, you train it on two objects and they can only see uh, two objects. Uh, and, and the important thing what I want to say here is that we really don't care about generating beautiful images. Uh, in fact, we are running a workshop right now on ECCV, um, and we just had a, 
uh, you know, neuroscientists saying that the internal model is very abstract, is not pixels, okay? So the one that generates the most beautiful image doesn't mean that it's gonna learn the best representations. So what we're actually predicting is feature maps. We predict some feature maps of the new scene that describe that new scene. Then we take the query viewpoint, which is the ground truth, what the image would be from that viewpoint, and compute features again, and we correlate them using uh, pixel or voxel-wise contrastive losses. I'm not sure if you've heard about such contrastive losses. And then we backpropagate, and yeah, the features that you learn can uh, correspond to objects over time, as well as across scenes. Basically, you learn beautiful features um, that can correspond across semantically similar entities. And you see here that the red curve is basically those features are better also started for pre-training 3D detection than the green curve, which indeed answers the question that predicting images, you end up learning worse representations than predicting in an abstract feature space, okay? Um, so yeah, surprisingly I have time. Uh, no, actually I don't, I have, I think I have three minutes only, which is great. Uh, so I don't have time to tell you exactly what are the problems that we have attacked with these architectures, but you can check the latest three, four papers on my webpage to check. We have used it basically for object 3D motion segmentation. Uh, we used it for language grounding and going from sentences to 3D feature maps of the uh, reality they depict, as well as visual question answering, which is work, work under submission. We have used it for 3D differential object detection. You talk to me about an object and I find it in the image in 3D. Uh, here is the visual question answering and visual question answering with very, very few labels. So basically our idea is that if you really want to ground language, first you need to go around the scenes, find the objects, describe them, disentangle their content and style, do most of the work without any, any supervision, and then use few human annotations to you know, do your final semantic task, which is answer the question or detect the object and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, we also work on uh, manipulation and uh, learning in treaty physics and so on and object dynamics. And again, the main idea is that given a scene, I'm not gonna try to learn how objects move or how they behave in 2D image space. I'm gonna lift in some uh, latent 3D feature space and predict motion of objects there using standard graph neural network technology. And the, the beauty about the 3D feature space is that in 3D, look at this bottle, how much it deforms as I change it right? But in 3D, it's exactly the same. So it is much easier to predict the future in a latent 3D space and then render it if you want to see something in 2D, as opposed to directly in 2D space where you really need to account for camera viewpoint. Um, and I think I have only one minute, so which means I don't have anything anymore. Uh, yeah. Katarina? Yes. The next talk is canceled, so if you need more time, you can take it. Yeah, no, I don't want to abuse simply because the, the other talk was canceled, but I want to ask you if you have questions, guys, so I can maybe, oh, here, I'm going to just leave this project, um, this uh, slide. Um, yeah, so we, we have a bunch of projects, uh, which is about, one is pushing those 3D visual representations further, handling multi-object tracking, ego motion estimation, uh, learning 3D object textures without supervision, just by looking around and self-inferring correspondences so on. We're very interested in what Tom Mitchell talks about, never-ending learning. We also believe in this, you have embodied agents looking around the scenes, inferring correspondences, updating their features and so on. We think 3D will play a very important role in such automated visual feature learning and as well as applications of those visual representations for language grounding and behavioral learning. Um, with that note, I would like to congratulate you on again of being here and I hope you have a great journey in the machine learning department and we're here to make it easier for you <clears throat> when the times are hard and to tell you that, you know, um, yeah, research is about search and it's not about success. Um, yeah, we need to enjoy even, even when we don't succeed. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Any questions on what I said?